Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So a couple months ago I did a review of this device here, the Analog Pocket. And I had mixed feelings on the device at the time. I thought it was really good for what it actually was meant to do, which is to run cartridge games like Game Boy and Game Boy Advance. But I also felt that the software environment was a little bit unrefined and also pretty limited. Well, about a month ago, Analog did a significant firmware update, which also opened up OpenFPGA. Well, that opened up the floodgates so that community developers could introduce cores for this device. And so now most of my favorite systems are now playable directly from the SD card on the analog pocket. And I released an initial video about a month ago just when these cores were first getting introduced. But even since then we've seen a lot of progress, it's almost been like daily updates at this point. And so now I think it's time to make a new video because just about every single system that I would want to play on the analog pocket is now possible. In addition to the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance systems, we're now seeing things like Sega Master System, Genesis, Game Gear, NES, Super Nintendo, and even some arcade games as well. And so in this video, I'm going to show you some of the quick ways that you can actually get this set up on an analog pocket because the process has improved greatly as well. And we'll also do a quick showcase to show some of the features that are now enabled, and I do expect this to improve over time as well. If we're seeing this many updates just in the first month, I'm really excited to see what this is going to look like six months from now. Anyway, without any further delay, let's jump right into it. So to start, my website has a dedicated analog pocket guide. You can find it right here on my front page. And I've been keeping this updated almost daily at this point. In addition to having instructions for each individual core, it also will walk you through the initial setup process as well. Most important thing would be to upgrade to analog OS version 1.1 or higher, and the instructions are right here. Now to actually install all of these cores, there are now automated tools that will do the job for you. And these two tools are very similar, but there are some distinct characteristics, so let's go over each of those real quick. We'll start with this one first, it's called the Pocket Core Auto Update made by Matt Pinella. This one is unique because it works on Linux, Mac, and Windows. And it's super simple to set up. All you would do is download the zip file that corresponds to whatever operating system you're using on your computer. And then all you have to do is unzip that file, take that executable, and then drag it over to your SD card for the analog pocket. From within the SD card, all you have to do is open up that executable file. Next, it's going to look through your file system and find whatever's missing. For example, if you have a firmware update, it will download the file for you and put it in there. Additionally, it'll scrub through your SD card and see whatever cores you're missing and then install them. Or if you have a core already installed and there's an update, it'll download that update and install that instead. So this is a great solution to get initially set up with community cores. And all you have to do is just run this script periodically and it'll also update the ones you have installed. In addition to installing the cores, it's also going to grab all the BIOS files you need to make sure that your ROMs will play correctly too. Now, while this solution is super simple, it's not quite perfect. For example, on that initial run, it's going to download every single core that's available on that repository, whether you want them or not. But I'll show you a fix for that here in a second. In addition to that, it's going to download a bunch of additional files that you don't actually need once it's gone through the process. For example, here on the main directory, you can see there are some readme files as well as a bunch of Mr. MRA files. And this installation process will actually install all of the arcade ROMs at the same time. And because the ROM files are installed as part of this process, you actually don't need these MRA files. So we're just going to go and select all of these in addition to this readme file we don't need either, and we can just delete them right off the card. Now in the future, if you only want to have specific cores showing up and updating, then we can go ahead and change this pocket updater settings file using a text editor. And within here you can see is a list of all of the cores that it's looking for. And all you have to do is change this from skip false to skip true. That's going to tell the system not even to look for that core the next time it runs an update. And so I'm going to copy that line of code and then I'm going to paste it everywhere that I don't want to have that core updated. Personally, I'm interested in keeping the handheld and home console system. So everything else I'm going to turn off. Anyway, once you're done doing that, just go ahead and save that file and we're good to go in the future. However, that initial run that we did already installed all of these cores that first time. So we need to go into each of these folders and remove them. We'll start with the assets folder. Here I'm just going to go and delete all of the folders that correspond to a system I'm not interested in playing. Again, I'm only keeping the home console and handheld systems right now. After you're done doing that in the assets folder, you want to do the same thing within the cores folder. Now finally, once that is done, we can go into the platform section and delete all of the JSON files that correspond to those same systems. 
And once you're done with those, go into the images folder here and then download the same ones as well. Not every single one of these are necessary. Actually, all you really need to do is remove the platforms files, but all the same, I wanna keep it nice and clean. Okay, so that's the first of the two tools. The main advantage here is that it can use both Linux, Windows, and Mac. But the downside is on that first initialization, it's gonna install everything and you'll have to go in and manually remove them and then also change that update or settings file too. Not the end of the world, as you saw, it took us just a couple minutes to clean that up. So now let's look at the other tool we have available. This one is also very similarly named. It is called the Pocket Updater. Now this one is only Windows based, but it has a graphics user interface, which makes it really easy to use as I'll show you here in a second. Same process with this one. We're gonna download the zip file, then extract that zip file, and then it's gonna have an exe file as you see here. We're gonna drag that over to our SD card. Anyway, once you run this file, as you can see, it's gonna open up with this menu. First, I would go into manage cores, and then here you can uncheck the systems you don't wanna have downloaded. Again, because I'm focusing on the handheld and home console systems, I'm gonna remove all these other extra ones here. Next, we can go into Update Pocket, and then here we can select Current Directory if we've added the file to our SD card, or you could even do this directly on your computer and then move the files over afterwards. Either way, I'm gonna do Current Directory because this is my SD card, and then it's gonna look for firmware updates and then start the process. And this process is very similar to the one we just did. The only real difference here is that we were able to uncheck certain cores beforehand. But like with the other one, this is going to install BIOS files as well as the arcade ROMs if you want them. Either way, once it's done running, you can go through and read the log and see what happened. In fact, there will be a log file within the directory as well if you want to check that later. Now, like with the other one, this will install those MRA and README files on your root directory, so you can delete those if you'd like. But once you've run either of these two tools, we're actually ready to go to start adding our games. So we'll go into the assets folder here. Within here, you're gonna find a bunch of subfolders and inside of each of them is gonna be a common folder. Within that is where you're gonna put your games and with the systems that require it, you'll see that the BIOS files are already there. Now I already added my games to the SD card as you can see here, but on my website, I have a list of all the file types that it'll accept. Either way, yes, the next step here would be to go through and grab all of your ROM files from your home collection collection and then move them over to these folders. Now the Neo Geo Core is unique because it only accepts one type of ROM set and I have all that spelled out in my written guide as well. Either way, that's all you really have to do to get this up and running to run your cores. You need to update the firmware on Analog Pocket in the first place, then use one of those auto update tools to install all of the cores and then just move over your ROM files and we're ready to go. You can eject the SD card, put it into your Analog Pocket and let's start rolling. Now you'll find everything under the open FPGA menu. And within the settings, you can actually have it boot to this menu directly. As you can see, it's gonna list all of the available cores. And then if you go in here and then select run, you'll see all of your games. And for the systems that require a BIOS file, you can see right here, it's gonna have the boot menu. Now, thankfully, the Game Boy Core now has this nice green colorization to it. And the Game Boy Core, like with a couple others, also has the ability to use memories, which are save states. So you can save them by pressing analog and up, and then you can go into memories and then load them. Also, some of these cores now have specific settings which you can access from the menu. One of the most helpful ones is the load cartridge option, which will allow you to actually go and boot a different game without having to close out of OpenFPGA. It sounds like a very simple thing, but it actually will save you a lot of time if you want to jump back and forth between different games. So yeah, Game Boy's working great. Same story with Game Boy Color. Exact same process here. In fact, most of these options are exactly the same. Now I think we're gonna see new options become available in the near future. Things like allowing us to change the display settings. But for now, most of these cores do not have additional display settings. But this is one of those things, much like the save states, that I think are going to get standardized over time. Just because they're not available as of making this video, I bet in a few months they might be there. Either way, it's awesome to be able to jump in and out of games like this directly from the SD card. Let's move over to Game Boy Advance. This is a very similar process here. All three of these cores are made by the same developer, so it makes sense that they all work similarly. Now within the core settings for GBA, you do see here that there are some additional options like the ability to change high quality audio or additional rumble strength. But yeah, Game Boy Advance works great, save states as well. And the options for the Game Gear Core are very similar here too. We can load the cartridge and it also supports save states too. It's pretty cool to see the Game Gear running on a device that is obviously inspired by the Game Boy. 
Along those similar lines, there are other Sega systems that are available. For example, the Sega SG-1000 is also working really well. And same thing with Sega Master System. Each of these are also supported by save states. And so if you want to get some of those mid to early 80s Sega games working, this is kind of cool. But definitely my favorite core to watch right now is the Sega Genesis one. We've actually been seeing this one get updated in real time over the past week or so. When the alpha for this was first released, it was pretty buggy and it had some graphical issues. But I'm happy to report that as of yesterday, most of these games are actually booting just fine and the graphics look great too. We have plenty of options within the core settings too. We have the ability to change the region if we would like. And we can also make some additional adjustments to the aspect ratio as well as the sprite limits and some audio filters as well. So overall this Sega Genesis core is coming along nicely. We've seen a lot of improvements just in one week. Now I personally grew up playing the Sega Genesis so it's super cool to see some of my favorites working in such an accurate environment. The input latency when playing this is just incredible and the screen is super sharp as well. Okay, moving on, let's try out Neo Geo next. Now the user experience on this Neo Geo core has improved from the last time I made a video about it. At this point now, once you have the correct ROMs installed, everything else will just kind of fall into place. All you have to do is just pick the game and it'll boot right up. That being said, the loading time for Neo Geo games can be quite long depending on the size of the file. But once you have it going, you're gonna be able to have access to most of the Neo Geo catalog right here. And the games run really well too. In fact, the graphics quality on this core in particular is just amazing. It blows me away just how nice each of these look. It definitely takes advantage of the high resolution display on the analog pocket. Okay, moving over to one of my favorite systems of all time, the NES now has a working core as well. This one has some core options like being able to hide the overscan as well as having additional masking on each of the sides. This is going to make the image look a lot more like it did on an original CRT television. Additionally, you can remove the sprite limit here, and then also there are different color palettes that you can choose from as well. Personally, I like the third color palette. It seems the most balanced to me. And I really appreciate the ability to remove the sprite limit, because that is kind of a big deal on NES. If you look here while playing the Manhattan Project, you can see that all of the characters have a lot of shimmering going on because of the sprite limitations. So if we go in here and turn on the extra sprites, as you can see here, now the characters are nice and solid. And of course, it'll be up to you whether or not you want to have that original NES experience or you want to have kind of these optimal character sprites. Either way, it's super cool that we're able to do that on an FPGA like the Analog Pocket. And yeah, this one looks great as well, super sharp and clear. Moving on, the last home console system that's available right now is the Super Nintendo. This one also has a variety of core settings as well. One of my favorites here is the ability to toggle between 8x7 and 4x3. And so depending on what side of the aisle you stand on when it comes to Super Nintendo emulation, you can choose either one. Personally, I'm a 4x3 kind of guy, so let's stick with that with this video. Either way, this core also takes advantage of that high resolution display on the analog pocket and these games look great. Now there are some limitations to these cores as of right now, for example save states don't work on many of them as well as sleep functions don't either. But one of my other favorite things about these cores is that in addition to playing the original ROMs, most of them will play mods and updates as well. So here I'm running the Ted Woolsey version of Final Fantasy VI on the Super Nintendo and it's working great. Additionally, some homebrew games like the new Super Mario Land game also work on the analog pocket. This is super cool. Now in my initial analog pocket video, one of the things that I didn't like about the analog pocket is the fact that the aspect ratio of the screen is 10 by 9 and not 4 by 3. Now of course 10 by 9 works great for Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, but all the other systems, especially all the ones that we're playing on the cores, mostly look best at 4 by 3. So just bear in mind if you do plan on playing some of these other systems on the analog pocket, you will get black bars on the top and bottom. But I don't know, it's not the end of the world to me. After I start playing the game for a bit, I don't even notice them there in the first place. Either way, there have been a bunch of impressive updates to the Super Nintendo core, and a lot of the majority of the systems, even the ones that use special chips, are now working with this core. Even some of the games that weren't working in the beginning, like Top Gear 3000, are now working. And Super FX games are working really well too, so Star Fox and Yoshi's Island are perfect on the analog pocket. Now when I first did the initial setup, I didn't install those arcade cores, but I didn't want to leave you hanging about those as well. Let me show you that these are working too. And if you use those auto-updater tools we showed earlier in the video, it'll actually install the ROM at the same time. I'm not really sure how they're getting away with doing that. I know a lot of the Mr. Cores do this already, so it might be similar in that regard. Either way, let's just not talk about that aspect, and let's look at the gameplay. So Dig Dug is working just fine. I have no idea how to actually play this game, but it looks great. 
Now Galaga I do know how to play, but I am super terrible at it. Either way, it is playable here. You're also going to find other games like Green Beret and Russian Attack, as well as some Tecmo games like Rygar. And there's some really old school games on here as well, a bunch of Atari games, and you can even play Pong. So really, that's about it for this video. I just wanted to show off some of the updates for the Analog Pocket that have been really exciting for me over the past month. To be honest, when I first bought the Analog Pocket, I kind of regretted my decision because I felt like it was just a little bit too limited by only being able to play the cartridge games. Now granted, for those who want to play games on a cartridge, it's a perfect device. But for me personally, I was always hoping that we would have a bunch of cores available too. And so for me, this is kind of a dream come true at this point. Not only do I have FPGA accurate gaming on a handheld device like this, but now just about every system that I want to play can be loaded from an SD card. Now when it comes to things I'd like to see in the future, I'd love to see the Turbo Graphics systems at some point, and maybe some of the extra Sega systems like Sega CD and 32X. Now I'm not really sure if the FPGAs that are inside the analog pocket are going to be powerful enough for systems like PS1 or Sega Saturn, but that would be super cool too. Either way, I think I'm sold on the analog pocket at this point. In fact, I've been thinking about getting the dock for this device so I can consoleize the analog pocket. The only problem here is the shipping costs of the dock here to Hawaii are just ridiculous. I can't believe analog is charging this much, but that's a tale best told another time. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. And be sure to check Check out that written guide I have in the video description for more updates down the line. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.